Genesis 24. Genesis 24, it's page 18. If you're using the Pew Bible. And we're going to be focusing our attention on verses 29 through 61. Last week we saw how Abraham sent his servant back to his fatherland to find a bride for Isaac. And we saw how God in steadfast love and faithfulness led that servant to just the woman he had prepared. He led him to Rebekah. And now the servant must finalize marriage arrangements with the family. Beginning in verse 29. Rebekah had a brother whose name was Laban. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring. As soon as he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's arm and heard the words of Rebekah, his sister, thus the man spoke to me. He went to the man, and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. He said, Come in, O blessed of Yahweh. Why do you stand outside? For I have prepared the house and a place for the camels. So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels and gave straw and fodder to the camels. And there was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. Then food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. He said, speak on. So he said, I am Abraham's servant. Yahweh has greatly blessed my master, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds, silver and gold, male servants and female servants, camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore, him, bore a son to my master when she was old. And to him he has given all that he has. My master made me swear, saying, You shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But you shall go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. I said to my master, Perhaps the woman will not follow me. But he said to me, Yahweh, before whom I have walked, will send his angel with you and prosper your way. You shall take a wife for my son from my clan and from my father's house. Then you will be free from my oath when you come to my clan. And if they will not give her to you, you will be free from my oath. I came today to the spring and said, O Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, if now you are prospering the way that I go, behold, I'm standing by the spring of water. Let the virgin who comes out to draw water to whom I shall say, Please give me a little water from your jar to drink. And who will say to me, Drink, and I will draw for your camels also. Let her be the woman whom Yahweh has appointed for my master's son. Before I had finished speaking in my heart, behold, Rebekah came out with her water jar on her shoulder, and she went down to the spring and drew water. I said to her, Please let me drink. She quickly let down her jar from her shoulder and said, Drink. And I will give your camels drink also. So I drank, and she gave the camels drink also. Then I asked her, Whose daughter are you? She said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bore to him. So I put the ring on her nose and the bracelets on her arms. Then I bowed my head and worshipped Yahweh and blessed Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who had led me by the right way to take the daughter of my master's kinsman for his son. Now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing has come from Yahweh. We cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go And let her be the wife of your master's son, as Yahweh has spoken. When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before Yahweh. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, Send me away to my master. Her brother and her mother said, Let the young woman remain with us a while, at least ten days. After that she may go. But he said to them, 
Do not delay me, since Yahweh has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. They said, Let us call the young woman and ask her. And they called Rebekah and said to her, Will you go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebekah, their sister, and her nurse, and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said to her, Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Then Rebekah and her young women arose and rode on the camels and followed the man. Thus the servant took Rebekah and went his way. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you because you truly are a God abounding with steadfast love and faithfulness. We thank you that even today you've given us in the rain a reminder of your faithfulness. That just as you send the rain down from heaven to accomplish your purposes, so too, Father, you send out your word. Your word which will accomplish the very purposes you intend. Your word which will not return to you void. Oh, Father, I thank you for this wonderful congregation. I thank you for the privilege of serving these people. Thank you for the faithfulness that you have already worked amongst us. Continue by your own faithfulness to produce a greater faithfulness in us that will show your very image, that will be seen by others to the praise and the glory of your name. We ask it now in Christ's name. Amen. A sister in Christ recently posted the following on Facebook. If you have no family nearby, parenting is hard. If you have no friends, parenting is hard. If you have no spouse or partner, parenting is hard. If you have a live-in grandparent, parenting is hard. If you have the best girlfriends in the world raising their kids with you, Parenting is hard. If your family lives across the street, parenting is hard. There's no need or use in comparison. Raising children is one of the most important things you'll ever do. It will always be hard. You are doing an amazing job. Keep showing up. Now, I know that this sister has a tender and compassionate heart. She has a desire to encourage those who are discouraged But at the risk of sounding like an old curmudgeon this morning, I'm going to tell you that I despise this sort of stuff. I this is this the this is just an example of the you you go on Facebook, you will see this sorts of stuff all the time, and I despise it because it is Christless and it is gospelless. It is right to acknowledge human frailty. It's right to acknowledge the difficulty of life, but without the hope of the gospel. It offers no real hope. And when we try to encourage others without a proper understanding of God's gospel, we will inevitably uh, end up distorting God's law. We have to lower the demands of God's law to something that we think we can accomplish in our own strength. And so Facebook posts like this get posted, and they tell discouraged parents, keep showing up. As if that's the best we can ask of parents as a society, that they keep showing up? Is that the pinnacle of parenthood? What does God demand of parents? His law is quite clear. God demands that every single parent, first of all, love him with all of their being. And then flowing from that, that they love their children as themselves far more than showing up. You might say God's standard is so high that it's practically unreachable. Exactly. None of us meet it. And this is true of any and every aspect of God's law. We're not focusing on parenting this morning, just using that as an example. In every area that God's law applies to, we fall short. And that's why we need the gospel. And we need to understand and adore those doctrines that undergird the gospel. We need the doctrine of the atonement that tells us that Christ perfectly kept God's law in our place. We need the doctrine of justification 
that tells us that when we receive Christ by faith, that his perfect law keeping is imputed to us. It's as if God opens our record book and writes Christ's righteousness there. We need the doctrine of sanctification that tells us that in Christ, the Spirit is working in us to grow us and perfect us as law keepers. We need the doctrine of glorification that tells us that one day God is going to bring that process of sanctification to its end. That we will be perfected in the likeness of Christ, perfectly keeping God's law from there on. And when we don't understand the gospel, when we don't understand those doctrines that undergird the gospel message, the passages that speak of God's law will be to us like Mount Sinai. We will hear the thunder. We will see the lightning and the smoke, and it will be fearful to us. And when the preacher comes to a text that holds up the goodness and the righteousness and the holiness of God's law, well, far too many believers will hear the condemning voice of the judge rather than the lovely voice of their Lord. And I suspect that in many places, the proclamation of God's law is not confident, it is not joyful, it is not full-throated, precisely because the gospel isn't proclaimed that way either. Our preaching text this morning is one that reminds us of the high demands of God's law, the high demands of discipleship. We're going to see it in the example of the servant, how faithful he is to what he has been called to do. And if we do not hear the implicit demands that he is living out, the demands that he is placing on this family that he's interacting with, if we, if we don't hear the demands of God's law through the gospel, if we don't hear them as those who are resting in Christ, we are either going to ignore it or we're going to want to give up or we're going to say, well, that's an exception. That doesn't, for some reason, that doesn't apply to me. So even before, even before we see that great exemplary faithfulness of Abraham's servant, let us first observe that his faithfulness was preceded and produced by the faithfulness of God. His faithfulness was preceded and produced by the faithfulness of God. Now, a large portion of our text, to us, it feels very repetitious. If you, we were reading it through in all in one sitting, you'd say, what, didn't I just read that? Well, yes, and it helps us to remember that these things were first written in a culture that was predominantly oral. Most people were not reading these things. They were hearing them, and the repetition was very helpful. And in this repetition, this portion that he repeats I want to go back, although we didn't read it yet, verse 27, verse 27, all that he repeats about God's faithfulness and how he's faithful to Abraham, how he was faithful to him and leading him to Rebekah, he has already summed that up in describing God's faithfulness in verse 27. Blessed be Yahweh, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. I want to focus your attention on these two Two words, steadfast love and faithfulness. I guess more than two words in English, but in Hebrew, they're two words. Chesed and emet. The first word, chesed, is hard to sum up in English with just one word. It contains uh, ideas of God's love, his kindness, his loyalty. I knew a brother who liked to translate it as loyal love instead of steadfast love. I think they're both wonderful ways to kind of capture what the word gets at. The second word, emet, basically means true. And it can mean true as opposed to false. But when applied to the character of a person, it means true in the sense that you can count on him. He's reliable or he's faithful. This is the first time in Scripture that these two words will appear together, especially in reference to God, but this will be far from the last. God himself will speak these words about himself in that great revelation of his glory to Moses on Mount Sinai. Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. For the Israelites, these two words, chesed and emet, 
steadfast love and faithfulness would become shorthand for all of who God is. Do a word study on this sometimes. Look it up. You'll see it uh, so many times throughout the scriptures. This is who our God is toward his people. He is loyal and faithful in his love for his covenant people. Some have even suggested that the Apostle John may have had these two concepts in mind, hesed and emet, when he was writing the preface to his gospel. And he may have had these two words in mind as he summarized the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Listen carefully to John 1.14. Listen especially to the two words he uses at the end. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, steadfast love and faithfulness. This isn't a part of God. God doesn't have parts. This isn't something just God does. This is who God is. He abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. It is who he showed himself to be to Abraham as he graciously made his covenant with him. It's who he showed himself to be over and over again as he brought him nearer and nearer to the fulfillment of the promises. This is Abraham's oldest and most trusted servant. This servant has seen God's faithfulness through the years. When he placed his hand under Abraham's thigh, very near to that covenant sign of circumcision, he swore by the name of the steadfast and faithful God of the covenant that he would fulfill this task that he had been sent on. And God showed his steadfast love and faithfulness to this servant by leading him immediately to Rebekah. And thus, even though for the remainder of this sermon, we are going to give much attention, as the text does, to the servant, we must see from the beginning, he's not the hero of the story. The servant is not the star of the show. God alone is. When God graciously shows his steadfast love and faithfulness to a man, it changes that man, and he is never the same When God reveals his goodness to us in Christ, it changes us and we can never go back. We never would want to go back because now, instead of viewing God as our enemy, instead of viewing him as some tyrant in heaven to be dethroned, by his grace, we've come to see his loveliness. We've come to see his majesty. He's not our enemy. He's abounding, abounding, overflowing with steadfast love and faithfulness. He is full of grace and truth. We're transformed by knowing him, as John 17, 3 says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And thus, in our text, the servant shines out as an example of one who has been made faithful through the knowledge and experience of God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness produces faithfulness in us because like begets like. God is restoring his image in us. So let us see the nature of the servant's faithfulness and see how he fulfilled that high call of discipleship, how he was faithful to what he was called to. Look at verse 33. Verse 33. The food was set before him to eat. But he said, I will not eat until I have said what I have to say. Do you remember what the servant wanted when he arrived in town? Yes, he wanted to find a bride for Isaac. But do you remember what he was going to ask for? A drink of water. This guy has been on a long journey and surely he had provisions. But he was probably ready to sit down and have a proper meal. But he placed the fulfillment of his responsibilities above his personal comfort. And I think that in this first paragraph, beginning in verse 29, I think there is intended for us to see a subtle contrast with Laban and this servant. Now, later chapters will clearly show us that Laban's heart was twisted by greed. This was a man who was all about personal gain. And I think that's hinted at here in his introduction. For he isn't just struck by his sister's words. First, he notices the expensive jewelry that she is wearing. Again, anybody would notice that, but with Laban, we know that there's more there because of what the text will later show us about him. 
Unlike Laban, who would spend many years trying to get rich off of Abraham's family, the servant won't, won't even satisfy his hunger until he has fulfilled his obligations to his master. In this we may see that God faithfully works in us to give us a faithfulness that diminishes self. God's faithfulness is producing within us a faithfulness that diminishes self. A servant of God, a disciple of Christ, is not chiefly concerned with his own interests or his own glory, but with the interests and the glory of his master. As John the Baptist said of Jesus Christ, he must increase, but I must decrease. Do you remember your early years of walking with the Lord? I think in those early years, we are more aware of self-sacrifice because it's so different from whom we used to be. Maybe you're, you, you remember the first time you put money in the offering plate. And you just put what you had in your pockets, you know, just a little, maybe that was your fun money. And you just tossed it in because now you wanted to honor the Lord's purposes. Or maybe you can remember the first time you really gave sacrificially. Where... You weighed it because you knew if, if, if I give this, I'm going to have to reorient my budget. This is going to cost something. I'm not going to be able to do those things I would have liked to have done. And yet, the Lord worked in you in such a way you did it. And you were happy to do it. When you put that money in the offering basket, you were rejoicing. Or maybe you remember the time that you first canceled plans and had to rearrange your schedule to help a brother or sister in Christ. And maybe in the moment you were weighing the two so heavily, like, oh, I really want to do this. Haven't you had those moments where I, I, I was really looking forward to this, but now my brother, my sister is called, and I know I need to go, and I, I want to go. And you maybe felt divided, and you did go, and then afterwards you were thanking the Lord for helping you to choose the better thing. Isn't it amazing, though, once you've been walking with the Lord for decades, we can look back on those early sacrifices and some of them, they seemed so big at the time and we look back and they seem so small. Faithful sacrificial service by God's grace has just become a part of who we are. It's who he's fashioned us to be. God's faithfulness has made you willing and ready to set aside self for his purposes. In fact, you would say your experience now might be that you're caught off guard when someone thanks you for giving of yourself because you hadn't given it a thought. And you've had those moments where, where somebody thanks you and you try to minimize and you, or you try to deflect. No, don't put the attention on me. I didn't do this for thanks. I didn't do this to draw attention. No, you didn't think about it because you were focused on your master getting the glory. You're focused on serving him. Notice in our text that there is no hint that the servant is patting himself on the back. Not at one point does he draw attention to just how faithful he is. He begins when he repeats what we read of last week. He begins saying, hey, first let me tell you about my God's faithfulness to my master Abraham. Look at how faithful he's been to him. And then he moves on to himself. Look at how faithful he's been to me. Look at how faithful he was in bringing me to Rebecca. He gives, he gives God all the credit this is how Paul spoke of God's faithfulness through his own faithfulness. He gave God all the credit. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. This is why we sometimes pray before the sermon that God would get the preacher out of the way. We don't want to merely see and hear the preacher. We want to see and hear God working through him. We want to worship and honor God alone. And this is a prayer that we ought not just pray before the preaching of the word. This is a prayer we would be wise to pray for ourselves on a regular basis. God, get me out of the way today so that people might see less of me and more of Christ. 
That's why we are to work as unto the Lord, so that in our faithfulness, others might see a reflection of the God who abounds in steadfast love and faithfulness. Has the enemy been tempting you in this area? He certainly loves to try. He loves to come along and whisper to us, your work is unnoticed. No one appreciates all that you do. He wants uh, to distract us from the generosity of God. He wants us to only think that we are faithful, but forget that our God is faithful. And so that we might sound like the prodigal's older brother. These many years I've served you, but you never once celebrated me. That's the attitude the enemy would love to cultivate in us. But if we are in Christ, that is a soul-destroying lie. We must fix our eyes on God again as the servant is testifying here. Look again and again at Christ. If any faithful servant was ever unnoticed and unappreciated, certainly it was him. He was despised and rejected. He willingly veiled his glory. He allowed men to think less of him than what was true. In his own words, he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So again, I say, look again to Christ and see the self-diminishing servant who full of grace and truth would shed his very blood to save your soul. When the Spirit helps us to be a a faithful, self-diminishing service, He's helping us to walk the path that Christ has already trod. I won't eat a bite, said the servant, until I've said my peace, because for him, serving the Lord came before serving self. Well, let's move on. Look now at verse 49. Verse 49. At this point, the servant has given a clear account of all that God has done. He's shown how God has clearly revealed his will through providence. And again, if you weren't with us last week, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that sermon that that looks at those earlier verses in detail. But now in verse 49, the servant asks Rebecca's family, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to respond? Verse 49, now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. This is not what we would call a soft sell. Uh, The the servant is not asking them, you know, here's what I experienced. What what do you all think you should do? No, he is, at the same time as he's asking them what they will do, he's telling them what they should do. One commentator observes, the phrasing is so loaded and slanted as to deter non-compliance. On the one hand, the allusion to receiving divine guidance, which what he's referring to here is when he talks about in the previous verse being led in the right way, he's used the word emet again. God has led me in the faithful way. God has been reliable. He's setting it up back to the quote. It insinuates the meaning, if you will do as God has done, or the more threatening rhetorical question, will you go against God? The servant has testified to God's steadfast love and faithfulness. And now he suggests, he asks of Rebecca's family, will you respond in kind? Will you act as God has acted? This faithfulness that God produces in his servants is a faithfulness that confronts others. God's faithfulness produces in us a faithfulness that confronts others. Now, I, I debated how to phrase this point, how to, how to uh, confront sounds so hard. A gentler way to put it would be that he, uh, the faithfulness works in us to call others to faithfulness. And that's true, but I've intentionally gone with the word confront because I think it will be helpful to us this morning. If you hear that word with negative connotations, I would encourage you to banish that from your mind. I don't mean confrontation as something that is aggressive or rude, but rather something that is direct. Here's here's what I mean by confrontation. What we see the servant doing here uh, is is that since completing his mission depends on their response, he confronts them by one, getting their attention, and two, bringing them to a point of decision. 
That's all I mean by confrontation. In confrontation, we get someone's attention and we bring them to a point of decision. We reveal a decision that they must make. Another example of this would be how Joshua confronted the Israelites who entered the promised land. Listen to Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now therefore fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve Yahweh. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve Yahweh, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. The servant and Joshua have basically said, I I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be faithful to God. What are you going to do? Now that's bold, isn't it? But the word of God tells us the righteous are as bold as a lion. When our faithfulness intersects with the faithfulness that God demands of others, we should not be afraid to peaceably confront them and call them toward faithfulness. Imagine for a moment that you had an employee, that you had an employee and you had to send this employee off to Home Depot to pick something up. And you know very well that this employee uh, does not know a wrench apart from a pair of pliers. This is not the ideal candidate, but this is your only employee. But you know that at Home Depot, they have many employees who can help your employee. So you send him off. And I want you to imagine that a little while later, this employee comes back empty-handed. He hasn't gotten what you requested. And you might say to him, well, what happened? I, I couldn't find it. Well, did you ask the employees? If he responded, yes. I asked everyone I could find, and they were entirely unhelpful. None of them wanted to do their job. I tried, I tried. You might forgive your servant, if your employee, if he returned like this. But if you asked him, did you ask the employees for help? And he said, well, no. They, they all looked so busy. I didn't want to interrupt them. Uh, somebody was driving around a tow truck and another guy was reloading the shelves and half the employees uh, were talking to each other in the aisles and they looked like they were having such good conversations with each other. Well, who am I to interrupt them? I didn't want to stop that. If this is the response you got from your employee, you would quite rightly be upset. He was unfaithful to his job because he was unwilling to call others to be faithful to theirs. When we have been transformed by Christ's faithfulness toward us, we will will be more concerned about pleasing him than pleasing others. Therefore, we will confront others when faithfulness requires it. For example, if we really want to share the gospel, we have to be comfortable with confronting others. There is a sense in which sharing the gospel creates a confrontation. Again, remember how I've defined that term? I don't mean that we should be aggressive or hostile. When we share the gospel, we should do it in a way that seeks to grab people's attention and to bring them to a point of decision. I even want to be extra clear and say I'm not preaching decisionism. I knew a brother who would uh, all but put people in a headlock to try to get them to pray the sinner's prayer. I am not exaggerating. If If you let him in your home, he would not leave a home until he got somebody to pray the sinner's prayer in that home. I attended an event at a church where they did that whole, hey, everybody bow your head, close your eyes, pray this prayer, raise your hand if you prayed that prayer. Then they did what most places that I've been at do not. They said, now everybody look around. Well, instantly people started putting their hands down and they went a step further. If you raised your hand, we want you to come forward. Well, the gentleman behind me had raised his hand. He had put his hand down and he was not going forward. Ushers had been watching out for who raised their hand, and an usher approached this man and effectively browbeat him into coming forward. That's terrible stuff. I say it with a smile on my face in part only because it's so absurd. It's hard to imagine those things even happening. That's not what I'm promoting. That's not what I'm promoting this morning. What I am saying is that we ought not present the gospel so weakly and so insipidly that it sounds like a suggestion that it just sounds like we're giving somebody good advice that they can take or leave. The preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ presents us with a life or death matter, a life or death decision. 
All who are here, if you are here and you've not yet trusted in Christ, hearing that Christ died for sinners and rose again presents you with a life and death decision. Will you continue under the wrath of God as an enemy of Christ? Or will you repent and believe in Christ? Listen to how Paul created this confrontation in Athens. This is Acts 17.30. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. God commands all people everywhere. That means you, Athenians. That means you who are here present. The gospel call to receive Christ is both a gracious invitation and a confrontational command. If we are faithful to love one another, it's going to lead to confrontations in the church. Not fights, not arguments. We've fallen into sin if they go to that regard. But where we have those direct confrontations, those direct conversations where we call each other to greater faithfulness. Now, I think our minds are prone to think of confronting sin when we talk about the word confrontation, but that's not the only way we confront. Yes, that is part of it, but just calling each other to do what God has called us to, stirring each other up to love and good works. I had a different example in mind, but I have to just tell you, um, when I walked in the sanctuary doors this morning and how quiet it was in here, that was like getting a gift from God. Uh, to see, I'm sure, I see Ron back there sitting up here. Uh, we've talked about this before as elders, sharing with the congregation the encouragement uh, to enter with quietness and, and prayerfulness and preparation. And there's many of you who are trained in that under faithful previous pastors. In fact, it was someone in our congregation who a few weeks ago said, Pastor, could you, could you bring this up? And I was looking for an opportunity and all my point is, that was a confrontation. I was uh, looking at an appropriate point in, in a sermon to bring that out. And this congregation responded so wonderfully in faithfulness. You, you, you share things in a simple way with each other. Here's, and we trust God to bring the work. Abraham's servant was faithful. He faithfully confronted Rebekah's family. His presentation was so clear and so persuasive that look at verse 50. They acknowledged the thing has come from Yahweh. We cannot speak to you bad or good. That basically means you have no argument here. We can't speak anything against it. We're going to, we're going to give Rebecca to be Isaac's bride. And from that point, it seems all good. It seems like this should be the resolution to our, our, our account here because in verses 52 through 54, the the servant worships again. He brings out the gifts. These probably functioned as a dowry, as a bride price. They have a meal. They celebrate. They go to sleep. And then at the end of verse 54, when morning comes, the servant is ready to continue his mission. And he asks to be released from the family's hospitality. He says, send me away to my master. Everything that we know about ancient customs tells us that this is very unusual. It's already a strange proposal. Hey, you want to come back to a land you've never been to and marry a guy you've never met? That's already strange. But now he's saying, we need to leave right now. The family pushes back. She can go, but can we at least say our goodbyes first? There's, there's celebratory customs that, that, that most peoples would engage in. Uh, can we at least celebrate some? Can we, can we throw her a bridal shower? Can we at least do that much? In verse 55, the family, according to the ESV, asks for just 10 days. If you read some of the commentaries on this, some of the Jewish interpreters suggested that they were asking for not 10 days, but because some of the words here can be used, one of the words here, a word for day, can be used as a word for year in the Old Testament. They're suggesting they're asking for a year in the ballpark of 10 months. If that were the case, we might understand why the servant wants to leave so quickly. I, I don't know Hebrew well enough to offer my own scholarly judgment on this, but I can tell you that many interpreters, both ancient and modern, think that the shorter period of 10 days is the better translation. That's how the uh, uh, Jewish-Greek interpreters of the Septuagint, the translators of the Septuagint, that's how they understood it. Calvin is very blunt on this matter. He calls the longer time frame 
a forced interpretation that he doesn't think there's any reason to read that into the text. So I think we ought to take the ESV translation at face value. They were asking for a week and a half. Just give us one. We may never see her again. Give us 10 days. Give us a week and a half. And the servant said, no, that's too long. Why was he in such a rush? Some have speculated Abraham was in poor health. Maybe that's why Abraham didn't carry this out himself. He will live many more years beyond this, but maybe at this point he seemed very sick and frail. Could be. The text just doesn't make that clear if that's the case. It's possible that he sensed wicked motives in Laban. The gifts have started to flow and Maybe Laban wanted to keep him around to get everything he could out of him. I mean, that's exactly what Laban will do later with Jacob. How, how much, what do I have to do to keep this guy from leaving to where Jacob has to leave in the night? As readers, I think we are at least right to consider that possibility. But again, I, I'm not confident that the text, the text at least explicitly does not say that's the reason he leaves. The reason he gives is in verse 56. But he said to them, do not delay me. Since Yahweh has prospered my way, send me away that I may go to my master. His justification for rejecting any delay is that Yahweh has prospered him. God has helped me. He implied in this, I'm on a mission. I'm a servant. I need to get back to my master. He simply appears that he just wants to honor his oath to God, his commitment to his master, and not to allow any delay to endanger the completion of his mission. I find this similar to Jesus' shocking refusal in Luke chapter 9. He asked the man, we don't know the man, he, 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 not asks, he calls the man to follow. He says, follow me. And the man says, let me first go bury my father. Many times preachers have, I think in an effort to make it more understandable, to soften it, have said, well, it's possible that the man's father is still alive. And he's saying, well, let me go home until my father dies and we deal with burial and inheritance and all that. And that this man wants a very long delay. But again, the, the text does not demand that. It's quite possible that this man's earthly father has just died. And Jesus is saying, no, you can't go back for the burial. Let the dead bury their own dead. You go proclaim the gospel. One commentator observes the demands of the kingdom override all earthly loyalties. And so God is working faithfully in us to produce a faithfulness that honors him above all else. A faithfulness that honors him above all else This is one of those areas where the biblical imagery of being a soldier is very helpful. Soldiers are men under authority. They're not free to do whatever they please whenever they please. Those of you who have served in the military, you learned that very quickly. That's what they teach you from day one, isn't it? You're not a civilian anymore. You don't have the freedoms of a civilian. You do what we tell you when we tell you. This is how it is for all Christians. But it is particularly exemplified in the life of those who are called to gospel ministry. Listen to how Paul, in what was almost certainly his final letter, listen to some of what he shared with Timothy. 2 Timothy 2, 3, and 4. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. There's a present-day preacher. I won't mention his name, but many of you would know him. And I was struck when I first heard another speaker refer to this preacher as a wartime theologian. I was like, what does he mean by wartime theologian? Because he's clearly not ministering in a time of actual warfare, not earthly warfare. What he meant is that this is a pastor who regularly encourages his flock to think of themselves as good soldiers of Jesus Christ, telling them, don't waste your life on foolish frivolities, but rather know the fullness of joy that comes from a wholehearted devotion to Christ. 
I want to tell you that I hope, with God's help, to be a pastor who lives and preaches in that way, to recognize the brevity of our days on this earth, and to serve our master as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. Don't live for comfort. Live for Christ. When faithfulness demands that we neglect social comforts or social customs and give up creature comforts, let us be those who do not hesitate. Let us be those who would say, do not delay me since God has prospered my way. I'm not implying that it will be every context that we throw off every social function. Hear me with wisdom. The context, the situation will determine what faithfulness demands. One of my greatest fears would be becoming a church that knows so little of God and so little of Christ that we cannot handle nor have any appetite for anything more than empty platitudes. Where what we can handle and what we want to hear from the pulpit is every Sunday, you're doing great, keep showing up. That's not what we need. And I know that here that's not what we want either. I don't want us to be a church that just shows up. Oh, that God would give us the faithfulness of a Nehemiah who says, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and come down to you? Oh, that God might give us the faith and the faithfulness of a man like Caleb who would say, give me that mountain. Give me this mountain. If God is with me, we can kick the giants out. One of the things I pray from time to time, I'm sure you've probably heard me pray it before. God, give us Catawissa. Give us Catawissa. Give us Columbia County. Give us the faithfulness. What's implied in that prayer is that God would work everything in us so that we could go out with prayer and the gospel and win many for Christ. Not just show up. Not just show up, but fulfill the mission that he's called us to in our time. Well, let's finally look at Rebecca's response. Rebecca's response. The family sees the servant's urgency and they leave the matter to Rebecca. Her faithful response is given in just three little words. I will go. How wonderfully simple that is. I will go. I won't belabor this with the length we've spent already, but throughout this chapter, Rebecca has been subtly compared to Abraham. We're supposed to, I think, see a reflection of Abraham in her. She shows fast and generous hospitality. She goes when God calls. When God calls her to a place she's never been before, she goes. And then she receives this blessing from her family that is almost identical to the blessing Abraham has received from God. She is receiving a blessing that will lead to the coming of Christ. And like the servant, God has given her a faithfulness that seeks to honor God above all else. Her response reminded me of the missionary couple Adoniram and Anne Judson. Lest you think that these accounts are just Bible stories, children, lest you think these are fairy tales that were just for people long ago, God's word has continued throughout history to shape his people in this way, and Adoniram and Anne Judson are a lovely example of this. When Adoniram asked for Anne's hand in marriage, he asked knowing that they would be headed for the dangers of the mission field, and so this is from the letter that he wrote to her father. I have now to ask whether you can consent to part with your daughter early next spring to see her no more in this world. Whether you can consent to her departure and her subjection to the hardships and sufferings of missionary life, to every kind of want and distress, to degradation, insult, persecution, and perhaps a violent death. Can you consent to all this for the sake of him who left his heavenly home and died for her and for you, for the sake of perishing immortal souls, for the sake of Zion and the glory of God? Much like Rebecca's family, her father left the choice to Anne, and like Aunt Rebecca, she showed complete faithfulness. I will go. She would write these words, I rejoice that I am in God's hands 
that he is everywhere present and can protect me in one place as well as in another. He has my heart in his hands. And when I am called to face danger, to pass through scenes of terror and distress, he can inspire me with fortitude and enable me to trust him. Jesus is faithful. His promises are precious. Why was she willing to leave behind every comfort for the sake of Christ? What was her faithfulness rooted in? You heard it in her final words. It was rooted in the faithfulness of Christ. Jesus is faithful. His promises are precious. As we close, I confess what you already know, that I fall far short of what I've preached to you today, but I can preach it. And we can receive it joyfully and we can strive to press on in these areas with the strength that God supplies because we believe the gospel. Jesus was faithful and Jesus is faithful even now by his spirit producing his own faithfulness in us. And so ultimately... Although it will be through our faithfulness, it ultimately won't be by, it won't be because of our faithfulness. It won't be our faithfulness alone that changes this church or this town or trains up pastors or sends out missionaries or plants churches. It will be his faithfulness. To God be the glory. Would you pray with me? Oh yes, Father. If it would please you, and your word gives us every reason to believe that it would, would you work that faithfulness in us, making us more and more like Christ, that it's a joyful faithfulness, it's an easy faithfulness, even though it is, in a sense, a hard faithfulness, that it will cost much of what this world enjoys. But oh no, Father, we know because you've told us, and because we've had a taste of it, that it will come with richer and greater blessings. Would you work such things in us today? Teach us, Holy Spirit, how to apply these things in every moment of life and do so, Father, Son, and Spirit, for your great glory. We ask in Christ's name, amen.